here are the four different types of transfer functions. We've got this first column where everything is written in z to the negative ones, which is the type that we've done so far in this class. But it's also possible to write them in z to the positive ones. That's how we did it in S's when we were in our signals and systems class. And then for each types, we can either take them as sums or we can factor it and have factored products. So let me just give a quick example of each of these. Polynomial in z to the negative one might look something like uh, one plus z to the negative one minus one half z to the negative two. So there's your polynomial not factored. And maybe we've got a one minus a quarter z to the negative two in the denominator. And look at how different that is when we factor it. I hope you've seen this symbol before, this capital gamma symbol. And it means instead of summing what's to the right, it means multiplying what's to the right. And this really weird symbol here is a, is a Greek zeta symbol that's traditionally used to represent discrete time zeros. And this is a lambda that's typically used to represent discrete time poles. So I'll just write that in. That's a zeta for zeros, and that is a lambda for poles. As an example of that, maybe we've got a one minus one half z to the negative one in the, in the numerator, and we might have one minus one quarter z to the negative one half one plus three quarters z to the negative one. And it's factored. You can quickly determine what your uh, what your zeros and your poles are from this from this type. This column is generally not used. Hey, in, sir. Yeah. Could I get you to zoom in that document a little bit on your screen? It's pretty hard to read. This stuff you've seen before. Typical polynomial in, in Z. And it's also possible to factor that. Here's one with imaginary zeros and real non-repeated poles. All right. Four different ways to write these things. I want you to have seen them one time. In graduate school, when we talk about anti-causal systems, they're often written in this form. When we talk about causal systems, they're usually written in this form. In industry, they're, they're causal systems. Nine times out of 10, we're going to be, you'll be using this form, which is why this is the form that I've been focusing on mostly. Poles are lambdas. Zeros are typically written as zetas. If you want to plot them quickly in MATLAB, the MATLAB command is zplane and you feed it your unfactored polynomial numerator and your unfactored polynomial denominator. So let me give you a quick example of that. Here's MATLAB, and to the right, you can see where the zeros and the poles are for the function h of z is equal to one minus one half z to the negative one minus a quarter z to the negative two, and one is in the denominator. And how do we go to a frequency response from h of z, where what we're talking about our frequency response is our h of e to the j omega. Charles, how do we do that? We have this h of z, which is pretty tough to draw because z is, is complex. It has a real part and an imaginary part. h is complex. It has a real part and an imaginary part. To, so to really draw it, we have to draw it as a three-dimensional volume in four-dimensional space, which is really hard to imagine. But what we could imagine is, say, the magnitude of h of z. You know what I mean? And now we can let z vary in this complex plane. Here's the real part of z. Here's the imaginary part of z. This is going into the screen. And then here in the vertical is the magnitude of h of z. And so now we can sort of imagine it. Now it's a surface in three-dimensional space. How do we extract the frequency response from that surface? Charles, I'm giving you the intuition approach, but the math approach is fine too. I'm not sure, sir. The math is easy. Just, Charles, I'm, you're not off the hook. Just compare your, this, this z to this e to the j omega. What do we plug in for z to get the frequency response? Same h. One is just a function of z and the other is a function of e to the j omega. So we just let z go to? Just j. Just e to the j omega. I mean, you can see this is taking h of the function z, of the variable z. This is h of the, of the variable e to the j omega. So you just set z equal to e to the j omega, and that's it. You're done. So that's one answer. That's the math answer. But the intuition, e to the j omega, as we increase omega, it draws a circle in our z plane. So all we need to do is to extract the height of h of z around that circle, and we've extracted the frequency response. And so, for instance, if that circle, this is at omega equals zero, this point would be omega equals 
uh, 90 degrees, pi over two radians per second. This is omega equals pi. So maybe I should maybe I should keep it all in radians to be proper. And then this would be omega equals three pi over two. And maybe it's maybe it's hopefully it's clear that there'll be a symmetry here on either side. And you can read off if this magnitude of H of Z is very high right over here at 90 degrees, it means it's going to be a bandpass filter that passes frequencies of about pi over two radians per second. And on the other hand, if this thing is a very high up here by pi, it means it's a high pass filter. It passes those high frequencies. And if it goes down to zero over here, at, at, if that surface goes down to zero over at mega zero, it means that it blocks those low frequencies. So the intuition is you just uh, extract that circular region around your H of Z picture. And that gives you the, if it's the magnitude of H of Z, it gives you the magnitude of your frequency response. If you're drawing the angle of H of Z, it'll give you the phase response. 